Hi, this is part three of Global Warming, How Humans Impact Earth's Radiation Balance. Part three is a compilation of a case against global warming. I am taking five of the most real scientific issues that I have identified and presenting the case against global warming. This is what happens in science. If you get an instructor that is acting like a religious zealot, that global warming is a fait accompli, that it is a guarantee, that it's basically their religious passion. Religion is a belief. Science is about disproving hypotheses. You can never prove anything in science. There's no proof of global warming. But this is not the uninformed echo chamber of nutcases that spin off into the other. These are real scientific issues. So take them as you will. Issues of global warming are debated extensively in politics, around the dinner table, and in science. This presentation focuses only on some of the scientific arguments made that we are what we are experiencing is not may not be global warming from increased greenhouse gases. The argument made here is that global warming, if it's real, is a trend. It's not cycles. It's not randomness. The other arguments made that it's due to factors other than greenhouse gases. So I'm going to start with something that everybody agrees on scientifically, that humans are flooding the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, that the CO2 is climbing because of our pollution, methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gases are climbing through the roof because of what we do to pollute our atmosphere. There's no disagreement anywhere on these data. The first scientific argument is that what we are seeing is due in part to changes in solar output. These are data for the 20th century on solar irradiance, that it was low at either end of the 20th century and that it peaked in the 1980s and 1990s. But even this simple graph of changes in solar output is greatly complicated because it's just not all solar radiation. As you know from previous lectures, there's different components of solar output, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and these all change as the sun changes. Science is not proving anything. It's making hypotheses. But sometimes scientists get emotionally wrapped in their hypotheses. And this is what happened around 2005 when two Russian, what are called climate skeptics, think that the global temperatures are driven by changes in sun's activity. And they think that we will see a slide in warming. So they bet Japanese scientists. Both sides agreed to compare the average global temperatures between 98 and 2003 and between 2012 and 2017. And if the temperature drops, which it did not, the idea is that the Japanese scientist will pay the Russian scientists. Now, I don't know how this bet turned up. I've tried to dig up the information, but it'll be interesting because this is a great example of you make a hypothesis, you're emotionally invested, you bet some money, and you see how it turns out. But it's still science. You test your hypothesis. You don't have a religious belief. So even though the Russian scientists lost their bet, and whether they paid up I'm not so sure. There are still changes in the sun. 
it is ramping down. So if you look at these solar cycles or SCs, the intensity was quite great in the 60s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and that the intensity of the peak and the depth of the low in the so low in the solar cycle cycle basically going down. Solar output is dropping throughout the decades of the 21st century. Put in perspective, the solar forecast minimum is going to be in the mid 21st century, with the modern maximum being the 80s and 90s. And then it's going to ramp back up as we approach the year 2100. There's quite good evidence that the much colder Earth that produced a little ice age between 1400 and 1850, which is about when the Industrial Revolution ramped up, was produced by solar minimal activity. And the prediction is that the minimum forecast in the mid-21st century might reflect what's called the Dalton Minimum the last kind of peak of the Little Ice Age in around 1850 or so at the start of the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> Here's a 1677 painting about the Thames River in England that froze over regularly during the Little Ice Age. It never freezes over now. So this gives you the idea that even a small change in solar output can result in a drastic change in climate, at least if you're in England. And the Little Ice Age did impact the rest of the world. So some people think that the solar minimum is going to be pretty much in the middle of the 21st century. Some people think it'll be at the turn of the 22nd century. But no matter what, Pretty much all solar models predict that the sun's going to ramp back up after this next drop in solar activity. So y there's no get out of jail free card here. You're not looking at a continuously low solar output. It's going to ramp back up, back up. So if greenhouse gases are causing global warming, all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. And when the inevitable occurs, it's going to be a double whammy, increase in solar output and having to deal with greenhouse gases. A second scientific argument is that stratospheric water vapor is to blame for some of the temperature signal that we're seeing with global warming. And that there are a tremendous amount of uncertainties about what controls water vapor in the stratosphere. This argument's been pretty much dropped. It's been quiet, but it hasn't been refuted. A third argument is that there are a lot of anthropogenic activities that can cool the Earth. I've shown this graph before, that there's sulfate air pollution, that there's biomass burning, there's organic carbon from fossil fuel building, there's dust in the atmosphere, and land use changes, all of which can cool the earth. This is another graphic to show the power of pollution and that what we don't know about the potential for our pollution to be a cooling agent as well as a warming agent. It's an argument, it's legitimate, and the point is that there are grave uncertainties about the role of different pollutants that we put out, whether they're cooling or warming agents, but there are a lot of cooling agents. This graph I've shown before is that there's volcanic activity that can cool the planet. Solar output goes up and down. Dust, greenhouse gases have been going up and up and up since the Industrial Revolution around 1850. But the green lines that diverge wildly are dust and aerosol forcings that can cool. And just how much it can cool, we're not quite so sure. an argument that used to be made very loudly against coal, reducing coal, taking coal out of the equation, is that coal burning produces sulfur dioxide, which is a major cooling agent. So 
as CO2 increases, a counteracting agent is called pollution. And so some people argue that what happens if you eliminate coal entirely, sure you reduce the CO2 emissions, but you also take out a cooling agent. It's an argument. So in summary, this third point is that there are big uncertainties. There's carbon black and there's other agents that can cool. And so the argument made is that until we understand these grave uncertainties, in the forcings of warmth versus cold, the scientific question is still uncertain. And that's the argument. A fourth argument is that the way climate models work have lots of problems. You have issues with how the model's built, with its resolution, with the initial conditions, with how you vary things in the model. Computer models are very powerful, but predictions vary and models have problems and uncertainties. They are not scientific reality. So that's the fourth argument. This is a great XKC cartoon dealing with the fourth issue about models and predictions and variability. It's really making fun of the fact that some people take their models way too seriously. So pause the presentation, take a look at it, and chuckle. Because scientists need to deal with the reality that they should be able to chuckle at their own work. The fifth argument is asking the question, how much of this warming signal is due to the placement of thermometers in areas that are experiencing urban heat island? An urban heat island is a very simple idea that cities have lots of concrete and asphalt that absorb the incoming solar radiation. It heats up and then re-emits it as long wave radiation, increasing temperatures, both high temperatures and especially low temperatures. So if you look at Phoenix, as it changed just between 1911 and 1940, it's underwent a massive change of increases in concrete and asphalt, and it heated up. This is a map of different temperature locations in the Metro Phoenix area. And you can see that as urbanization increased from even 1990 to 2004, the temperatures heated up greatly. More asphalt, more concrete, more warmth. So let's take a look at uh, what scientists call a control. Let's compare Phoenix's record with Kitt Peak, a rural location in the Sonoran Desert. Kit Pete's record throughout the 20th century has gone up and down and up and down. Almost looks like a couple of cycles with some random variability thrown in. So then you look at Phoenix and it's only gone up. So the fundamental question is, if you want a record of what's happening to the globe and not what's happening in cities, should you extract all of the, should you remove all of the thermometers that are located in cities because you're getting an urban heat island effect and not necessarily a clear climate change signal. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the urban heat island issue is not just one of sorting out the details of climate change. This is a science class, but I should point out that the areas experiencing the greatest urban heat island are often those where not so wealthy people live, that there's an issue of social justice. The areas with the minimal heat island impact are often the wealthiest. But that's not necessarily the case for Tempe. Tempe leaders that have taken great pride in the economic development of the city I take no pride in their accomplishments. In fact, I blame them. And 
the associated individuals who promoted this development. Tempe leaders achieved, and they like to tout achievements, achieved in 10 years what it took the city of Phoenix to achieve in a hundred years in terms of a urban heat island. So residents of Tempe will continue to have an urban heat island problem as long as the city leaders put their head in the sand use words like resilience and sustainability and then they turn around and they promote development that creates a terrible place to live because of an increasing urban heat island. Okay, I've told you my political views on this particular issue. I blame Tempe leadership and their mistakes for creating a massive heat island in the city. So if you don't like it, let them know. But it's just not Tempe. Look at this great shot of Christmas snow in 1999 for Chicago. You can see the urban heat island where the snows melted because of the heat of Chicago. And it's just not Phoenix, Tempe, and Chicago. Look at Tokyo on the upper left, Rome on the lower, lower left, various Texas cities in the upper right, and then all of the urban heat island mapping campaigns that have occurred from 2017 to 2022 throughout the conterminous U.S. and Hawaii. It's a global problem. There are a lot of thermometers in all of these cities. And so the simple point number five in this presentation is, are you seeing global warming or are you seeing an urban heat island? The broader point of this entire presentation is it's always a problem in science, sorting out the cause. Is it greenhouse gases? Is it solar? Is it an urban heat island? Is it due to uncertainties in the pollutants that are being put out? It's a graph to chuckle over, but in reality, it's a serious scientific issue, and it's important that I present information that is not biased. It's all not one side. I am not religiously predisposed. I have no emotional attachment to the issue of global warming. I think it's important to present the science in a basic physical geography course. In summary of this presentation, issues of global warming are debated extensively. This presentation focused on some of the scientific arguments that I decided to present that what we are experiencing may not be from global warming due to increased anthropogenic greenhouse gases. But please don't ask me my opinion. My job here is to present science and not my own bias.